Now we've looked at all the variables that can come to play to alter how we should approach a flexor tendon. We're now going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to look at each tendon zone. We're going to look at what's unique within that zone. And at the end of each section, there will be a chart compiling all of these variables. Now this is not intended to be a protocol, but what it is intended to do is to allow you to return to your protocol that you normally use or your approach that you normally use and begin to question, is the way that I approach the flexor tendon in this zone the most effective and efficient way for this patient with a zone injury. This should allow you to begin modifying your protocols so they are zone specific. Nothing drastic, nothing overwhelming, and these are suggestions for consideration. Zone 1, what's unique about it? We're talking about only motion of one joint that creates tendon glide and it happens to be the smallest joint and therefore the smallest amount of glide. This is perhaps the trickiest zone if for no other reason because it's at the end of the system. It's the last joint to receive power from your extrinsic flexors. That power has to cross the wrist, the MP joint, the PIP joint before it even reaches the DIP joint. So these can be challenging patients to uh, regain full range of motion. This article in 1995 from Arbuckle and McGrather was significant in helping me understand normal finger flexion and how I should approach patients with flexor tendon injuries as well as with many other problems. If you look at the schematic drawing with this representing the wrist, these dots, these dots represent the metacarpal phalangeal joint, PIP joint, and DIP joint. You will notice finger flexion is initiated at the DIP joint, but very, very quickly the PIP joint comes along in a constant ratio with the DIP joint. Before full finger flexion occurs, we go into a natural hook posture. Do you recall where we talked about the ideal posture being 15 degrees of MP joint flexion to allow IP joint flexion? It's interesting here that we see about a 15 degree posture of the MP joint as we're going into this hook posture in the middle of our sequence. Only at the very end does a metacarpal phalangeal joint flexion come into play and it comes into play most strongly when we grip and the endorossi are giving us that power we need to sustain a grip. We have a small joint, a small amount of glide normally, but remember we only need three to five millimeters to prevent adherence. So if we take a zone one flexor tendon injury, we go back to our five millimeters of glide at the DIP joint. If there's one radian, the patient only would need to move from 35 to 57 degrees at the DIP joint in order to obtain that much glide. Now Evans in 2005 suggested a specific protocol for Zone 1, which I have used with great success, but I would caution that this is perhaps not your first choice if it's been a crush injury and the DIP joint is also injured. This would be an appropriate protocol in my opinion for a clean laceration in Zone 1. Here we have a red dot that represents the suture repair site and a dotted line marking the level on the bone. Evans places the DIP joint in 
flexion. Now remember, 35 is the minimum needed. So she places a dorsal piece over the DIP joint, taping it in place, and by doing that, the passive flexion of the DIP joint literally pushes the suture proximally away from this resting position where it started. Full passive DIP flexion is allowed. There's no block to that. The extension is simply blocked. Now I would refer you to her work for the specifics of her protocol. But the essence of it is that Going from that position into further flexion gives you proximal glide as you repeat this motion. Thereby, the patient is learning to initiate at the DIP joint, which is part of normal finger flexion. If we look at Arbuckle and McGrather's graph, we see that only at the beginning and the end does this constant slope change. Normally during finger flexion, the DIP and the PIP joint are flexed in a constant relationship to one another. You can see from this graph that it is normal that there is always somewhat more PIP than DIP joint flexion. At 40 degrees of PIP flexion, there's about 25 of the DIP. And at about 90 degrees or 70 degrees, so there's always less. This means that if we will place the DIP joint in some flexion and ask the PIP joint to also flex, that we will reestablish that normal relationship and glide will occur at both joints, which is necessary for DIP joint flexion. Now here we are again looking at the flexor digitorum profundus we're looking at the MP joint position, the same graph we've seen before, and we see that the forces greatly increase as we flex the wrist. Therefore, in a zone 1 DIP injury, I would see no need to flex the wrist, but I would choose to flex the MP joints to 15 degrees. To create excursion, the only joint that needs to be moved is the DIP joint. But because the DIP and PIP joint always move in a constant relationship to one another, in large part by virtue of the anatomy of the dorsal apparatus, it's very important that this synergistic motion be allowed and encouraged if the patient is following an active motion protocol. Now zone 1 injury is within the synovial sheath and the blood supply to that area is coming both from the vincula as well as the synovium. However, it is not uncommon to have an avulsion of the flexor digitorum profundus either with or without a bony fragment and as we discussed earlier the healing of the bone tendon interface is very different from the healing of bone to bone or tendon to tendon. The work of flexion, we would want the wrist in no more than 30 degrees of flexion and the ideal for the MP would likely be 15 degrees of flexion. The lumbrical is reducing the load so finger extension is not unprotected. Evans first positions the DIP joint in flexion because it's much easier to gain extension or distal excursion than it is to gain flexion or proximal excursion from a position of zero. Therefore she favors the flexion for the initial period of her protocol and only then is full DIP extension allowed. The repetitions in zone 1 can be higher than in some other zones, although we do not know the ideal number of repetitions or the frequency. But this is a synovial area and therefore we can only speak in comparison to the other areas. The work of flexion in zone 1 is significantly altered by internal resistance because it is the smallest joint, the smallest pulley, 
the least excursion, the numbers become even more critical than in the larger areas which are more proximal. So the suture bulk is significant, the pulley, whether it's partial or released, is significant. Active end range flexion is not appropriate initially, although passive is certainly uh, encouraged and acceptable. And as with other joints, passive range of motion before active is very appropriate to decrease the resistance to any internal resistance. The external resistance that can be relevant is both interosseous and lumbrical muscle tightness. Therefore, the active hook posture, if an active protocol is being followed, would resolve both the interosseous and the lumbrical muscle tightness. But for that active hook to occur, the metacarpal phalangeal joint should, must be in more extension than flexion. So here we've taken all of these points discussed and we've placed them in a chart. So as you have the next patient with a zone 1 injury, I would encourage you to come to this chart, go through each point, decide if it's relevant to your patient, and then decide, am I going to change what I would normally do or not, and do I have a very good and valid reason for making a change?